Our first keynote today aims to discuss why we need a scientific revolution on strategy execution. And to present this topic, nobody could be better than Professor Roger Martin. Professor Roger Martin is the former dean of Rotman School of Management. Last year, he was named the world number one management thinker by Thinkers 50. Author of 11 books in the field, he is a trusted strategy advisor to CEOs of companies, including Procter & Gamble, Lego, and Verizon. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Professor Roger Martin. Thank you, Thank Roger. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Much. Thank you very much for the introduction, and, and first of all, thank you, Brightline and PMI, for doing this. I think this is very important work, and I'm, I'm uh, pleased and thrilled to be, to be here as part of it. I would also uh, like to say a thank you and a shout out to my wife, Marie-Louise, over here, who is my wife and business partner. It's our anniversary, and so she thought it was important enough. <laughs> she thought it was important enough to be here and postpone our anniversary for one day for, for uh, this purpose. So I'm all in on on this. So to to the task at uh, to the task at hand, um, I am arguing that we need a scientific revolution uh, in several management theories in order to accomplish what Ricardo and Brightline are trying to uh, accomplish. Um, now, the paradigm shift notion has now become, become sort of uh, trite. People will now use it to explain. They'll say, oh, the internet is a, par uh, is a paradigm sh uh, shift. AI is a paradigm uh, shift. They are misusing, I would argue, what Thomas Kuhn uh, talked about in 1962 when he, when he talked about scientific re revolution and paradigm shift. So just to review for a second, what, what Thomas Kuhn said is, in the development of ideas, there becomes typically a focus on a set of assumptions that form an existing paradigm, and science progresses with that, that, that paradigm by improving and improving and improving it, but not questioning the fundamental assumptions of the paradigms. And so you get lots and lots of improvement. That's the nature of scientific, scientific work, scientific progress uh, in the world. But from time to time, what happens is you get a slowdown in the progress that you've been seeking under, under that paradigm, and you get the arising of anomalies things that can't be well explained by the existing paradigm. Right? And when you get enough of those anomalies, some people start looking at the anomalies and attempting to form an explanation for those that is different than the existing paradigm. They tend to get brutally suppressed <laughs> because everybody is attempting to answer the questions and answer those anomalies only within the existing paradigm. But in due course, there are enough anomalies uh, and there's a, a compelling enough new paradigm that that new paradigm takes over and we have what he really called a paradigm shift, not just some new thing. It's a shift in the way we think about uh, things. And just to give you a, just a quick example of a, of a paradigm shift and kind of how compelling and important they are, uh, think of the world, it's not a pleasant world, of peptic ulcers. I don't know if anybody in the audience has had a peptic ulcer ever, but it's a very bad thing. It can be very damage, damaging. In fact, it can be uh, life-threatening. Uh, 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 doctors started to understand uh, in the late 1800s the phenomenon. By the early 1900s, uh, the medical world had converged on a paradigm which said the stomach lining of the uh, uh, of the stomach is very, very, very tender and, and fragile, and if there's too much acid in the stomach, that's what causes a peptic ulcer and the ulceration of, of, uh, of your stomach. So that was the theory, and it was sort of ensconced in 1910 when a doctor named Carl Sch uh, Schwartz, an important doctor, intoned the famous words, no acid, no ulcer. So if you didn't have acid, excess acid in your stomach, you wouldn't have an ulcer. Now that continued along, and based on that paradigm, there were all sorts of scientific advances on how to reduce the amount of acid in your stomach. 
One was to uh, prescribe a lower stress life, bland diets, but then more seriously, uh, a peptic ulcer surgery that changed the, the uh, acid production system in your stomach. And then later, uh, uh, drugs that uh, did the same, proton pump inhibitors. All of these things were actually quite damaging to you. So it was a bad thing to have a peptic ulcer because you had more damaging things done to you when you had a peptic ulcer to get rid of the peptic ulcer. But in due course, it became obvious that all of these advances were not actually curing all peptic ulcers, and it took a hell of a long time for these things to work. So, in due course, medical scientists and researchers started to ask the question, is, is this paradigm sen uh, sensible? And two a little bit wacky Australians, of course, uh, uh, decided that there, they had seen enough evidence to suggest, to suggest that uh, it was actually caused by bacteria, H. pylori. And they wrote papers, medical papers, on this, on this uh, notion. But since that offended entirely the existing paradigm, they couldn't get their papers published. Literally, the reviewers would say, well, this is dumb. You know, you're, you know this is not about acid, so this is, this is, uh, this is really dumb. Until one of the crazy Australians, Barry Marshall, ingested H. pylori, uh, grew himself an ulcer, cured it with antibiotics, and wrote a paper about that. And it finally got published. And as history progressed, people started to realize, wow, if you treat uh, ulcers with antibiotics, uh, it works a hell of a lot better, and you don't have to do all this other, uh, other crazy, uh, uh, crazy stuff. Um, but Interesting enough, that paper was published in 84. It took till 1997 until the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta declared the cause of ulcers was, was uh, H. pylori. It was a, a bac bacterial. And <clears throat> nicely, as a happy ending to the story, Marshall and Warren were awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine in, 19, er, in 2005. So 21 years uh, after the publication of the first paper. But that is a paradigm shift. Things were getting better. We learned how to, how to do things better on the basis of the paradigm. But the paradigm kind of ran out of steam, and it needed to be replaced with another paradigm. And as in most cases, the old paradigm wasn't stupid. It was just not good enough. So it turns out that H. pylori grows more aggressively. It flourishes better with higher acidic uh, content in, in your stomach. And so it wasn't stupid. It just wasn't actually the answer, and so we needed a new paradigm. OK? So I'm going to argue reasonably quickly, I hope, that there are three business paradigms that are absolutely dominant that are getting in the way of having happen what Ricardo, PMI, Brightline would like to have happen. And so I am suggesting that we revisit those and ask whether there's a paradigm shift that needs to happen. And I would argue we are seeing all sorts of anomalies in each, each of these of the sort that Thomas Kuhn referred to. So we're seeing anomalies that suggest that the theory isn't working as well as we hope it is. And I'm going to suggest in each case a, an alternative, uh, alternative paradigm. So first, corporation as a machine. Our view of the corporation is that it is like a machine, right? like a car. You press the gas pedal, and it goes faster. And you can break down the corporation into piece parts like you can a big complicated machine, like in a car. You can say, well, we're going we're gonna to deal with the suspension system now and make that better and have the results we want. And then we'll think about the propulsion system. And then we'll think about the safety system. And then we'll think about the electronics and comfort uh, features of it. It's just a, comp, a big uh, machine. It's fairly complicated, but it operates like a machine. Now, what I would argue is that there are anomalies that are showing their faces on this. So one anomaly is incentive compensation, which we, in machine-like fashion, say if we give incentive monetary comp uh, compensation, we'll get better firm performance. We've been doing incentive compensation for a long, long time. 
there are, I would argue, billions of person hours a year spent on designing compensation systems, managing compensation systems in companies. Yet there is no study. There's not yet been one rigorous study that shows there's a connection between incentive, monetary compensation, and firm performance. There's some to suggest that incentive compensation drives individual performance, but getting that to derive joint firm performance turns out not to be the case. But if the corporation was a machine, you should be able to do that. So that's an anomaly. In fact, I would argue that the only thing that there's a really positive correlation between is incentive compensation and time negotiating targets. Right? Because the most important thing to your economic welfare in most modern corporations is to be a super negotiator on your, on your targets. My friend Mike Jensen wrote, about, uh, wrote a wonderful piece about this called Paying People to Lie. Because the better you are at lying, the better your compensation will be. And, and the, the particular thing you have to be good at lying about is, is how hard it is to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. Ooh, it's tough out there, boss. Even holding flat from last year, that's, that would be awesome for the following 12 reasons. If you're really good at that, uh, you get paid, paid more. Not, you don't get paid more for being better at serving customers. How's about another one? If you can drive labor rates down, you should bec become more profitable. Oh, sorry. That doesn't work either. How about pursuit of shareholder va max maximization? If it was a machine, attempting to do that would get you that. Well, it turns out it doesn't. How about you create risk-managing financial instru instruments? Well, you accidentally create uh, financial weapons of mass destruction. I would argue that a better paradigm for the corporation is a complex adaptive system like the Amazon. That if we thought of the corporation as a complex, always adapting system that adapts in ways that are hard to understand in advance, we'd be better off as a paradigm than the paradigm of the corporation as a machine. Or if you'd like, we could say the paradigm is a whack-a-mole game. Push down one place and something will pop up that you didn't expect another place. What would the implications be of that? Well, one implication of that is when you press the gas pedal, the car might slow down, <laughs> might stay the same, or might speed up it is much harder to tell. And assuming that it is the last of those three is an error if your paradigm was this is a complex adaptive uh, system. It would cause you to say, I've always got to think about the system, not about the piece parts. If it's a machine, you can break it into its piece parts and see how each piece works, and then reassemble the pieces, and it'll be fine. That is the practice of modern management. That is the, the curriculum of an MBA program. Think about it. For all of you who've done an MBA, or wonderful critics of MBA programs like Henry, uh, well, well of, uh, Henry Mintzberg here in the front, who you'll be hearing from later, uh, uh, that's what they do. They break the corporation machine into its piece parts, teach you the piece parts, and then assume that you will somehow be able to add them, add them up, which, as it turns out, the vast, vast majority never master. This means you have things like Zainab Tan's wonderful work, and if you haven't read it, you've got to read The Good Jobs uh, a Strategy, where she says this complex array of pay your work in retail, pay your workers more, build in more slack, build in more training, and reduce assortment. That set of things, not pay your workers less because uh, labor is one of the biggest uh, costs uh, other than cost of, uh, of the purchased goods in, in retailing. No, pay more. But what frustrates the heck out of Zainab is, is most people read her work and pick one of those things to do because they have in the back of their mind, the corporation as a, as a machine and say, oh, Zainab says increase slack and I will increase profitability. Zainab says increase training 
and I will increase prof uh, profitability. Reduce assortment, and I will increase profitability. No, because it's a complex system. You gotta do all four of those things to get your, get your results. It's not the piece parts, it's the whole that we have to, be, uh, have to be thinking about. And the other thing that's an implication, I would argue, is that you've got to prototype iteratively in everything you do. In a complex adaptive system, no matter how much you'd like to plan in advance, you cannot figure out all the implications. John Sturman, the great uh, MIT professor, system dynamics guy, uh, says quite wisely, I, I think, um, that there, in life there are no side effects. There are just effects that you didn't think about in advance. It's not as though some are categorized as main and some are side. They're all effects, and it is hard for a human being to ever figure out in a complex adaptive system what all the effects are going to be. So prototyping, enhancing as you go, is smarter than trying to think in advance about everything because there will be then what John <laughs> dismisses as what you think of as side effects. And last one, and this may be simple, but it's important to make, is when dealing with human beings in the world of business, you gotta think about head, heart, and gut. Because what are human beings if not little complex adaptive systems? And when we think somehow we're gonna appeal to their head and that'll take care of the other pieces of the complex adaptive system, or we're gonna to appeal to their heart, and that'll take care of it, or we'll appeal to their gut, and that'll take care of the rest, is a fallacy and a fool's errand. We've gotta think about all those three things simultaneously if we're gonna deal with them as a complex adaptive system. So that's paradigm shift one, from corporation as a machine, to corporation as a complex adaptive system that, interestingly enough, is existing within a big complex adaptive system called the world. So that's number one. Number two, and I did number one first because this relates to number, number two, even though number two is, is uh, kind of most, most connected uh, uh, to what we're, what we're talking about here uh, today, strategy versus execution. Okay, so this is the dominant paradigm, has been the dominant paradigm in business for time reasonably immemorial, although at least back to 1963, which I count as the, as the foundation of strategy as a business discipline. We didn't talk about strategy in business much before that. That was found the foundation of Boston Consulting Group uh, and, and Bruce Henderson, Henderson's view of strategy, borrowing strategy from the military and applying it to the world of business. So at least since then, there has been a paradigm that there are two things, one's called strategy and one's called execution. As with many things, right, metaphor does play a huge role. So in, in, uh, in peptic ulcers, the metaphor of, this, of the stomach as this very, very delicate bag led to the view of it's about acid. Here, I would view that, that the metaphor of the human body is what's driven us to the paradigm that says there's a thing called strategy and a thing called, uh, called uh, execution. The metaphor, the human body, the brain makes choices. Roger, lift your arm, and then the, and then the body executes and lifts the arm. That's the metaphor. And it's a sort of a sensible metaphor, right? Because it's us, it's about us, it's about the human body, we're fairly familiar with it. Although brain science is telling us a hell of a lot more about how that actually works and it's not the way, the, the way this notionally works. But what we've done is imported that metaphor to the world of business to say senior leaders formulate strategy and the rank and file executes that strategy. Am I right? This is the absolute, dominant, utterly unquestioned paradigm in the world of business when it comes to strategy and execution. Any other theory that, that you've, you've seen out there? That's it. It's the perfect exemplar of Thomas Kuhn's dominant, dominant uh, paradigm. But it's throwing up, I would argue, an anomalies. 
a rise in what we see of as execution difficulties. All the bright line work suggests that this is an obsession of, of senior managers. It's hard to get execution, right? We've got lots and lots of it. So we have a theory that produces the opposite of what we w wished, right? A theory should help us make sure there aren't execution problems because we know exactly what it is and we know exactly that the brain should tell people what to do and they should go do it, just like we said. No, we have a rise in that. And we have a rise in unimplementable strategies. Right? Again, Ricardo started with that. Well, the, the implementation, strategy implementation, uh, you know, the statistics are horrible on it. Well, if you got a great theory, why would you have horrible results on both of these uh, dimensions? And I would argue that this isn't particularly new, the attention on, on uh, execution. The attention of, on execution has been, if anything, rising and rising quite dramatically. Right? We're thinking more about how important it is to have better execution. And are we getting better execution? Right? Not from what I can tell. Right? The hue and cry about execution has risen, if anything. Hence, PMI, hence, Bright line, right, is to solve a problem. Right? Here's my view, which is that we need a better paradigm. And for me, the better paradigm is the thing we refer to as strategy. And if you break down the activities that we engage in when we engage in this thing that we call strategy, is making choice under uncertainty and competition. Right? Strategy is making choices, right? And there's always uncertainty and competition. That's why it's kind of hard to make them, and you sometimes make them badly, but, and that's the challenge. Right? If you look and observe what we think of as execution when we say, go execute that. This is my brilliant strategy. We're going to win on the basis of customer service. Go execute that. What are the people who are, quote, executing that going to have to go and do? I believe they're going to have to go and make choice under uncertainty and competition, or it ain't going to happen. And when they do those things, they're going to hand off those choices to somebody else who is going to have to do what? Make choice under uncertainty and competition. So it does beg the question, for me at least, help, help me understand why it is we'd call one of those activities strategy and another execution, right? Last time I checked, generally speaking, in, in kind of language systems, when two things are exactly the same, we don't call them two different things. We tend to, you know, kind of consolidate on one description of the thing. Not always, but... It's sort of more efficient and effective uh, to do that. So if it's the same thing, why do we think of it differently? Now, sometimes we say, oh, the people at the top who are making strategy are unconstrained. The people below making strategies are constrained. But I hang around with CEOs all the time. Uh, and, and if I you know, told them, you know what people think, they think that you're unconstrained. You know, they would heave me out of, out of their office and say, please don't come visit me again. Right? You don't think I'm constrained by the capital markets, by regulation, by my boards of directors, blah, 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 blah. Nope. Everybody's making choices under a whole bunch of constraints, under uncertainty and, and, uh, and competition. For me, for what it's worth, the way I think about an organization is it's just a multitude of cascades and this for you, those of you who have who've read my stuff on strategy, I think of strategy as answering these, these five questions. Um, and they cascade from the very top of the organization all the way to the bottom of the organization. And the best companies that I deal with in those companies, the people toward the bottom of the organization think they're making important choices. They do not think they're executing. And the reason it's so important is because 
The strategy versus execution paradigm puts those who are, quote, executing in such a bad box that it is bad for the heart of those people. It does not capture their hearts because they're not fools. When some CEO comes up with an esoteric strategy to say, oh, this is how we're going to win. Now, 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 you just people go do it. They have a terrible choice, right? They can either obey, right, and engage in mindless doing, right? Because if you're not choosing, you're engaging in mindless doing, right? Right? You're just, quote, doing. So they can engage in mindless doing and not make any choices, in which case, what will happen? Bad things. And what will the cause of those bad things be viewed as being after the fact? What? Bad execution. So it's going to be those people's fault that it's bad execution. What if instead they're completely insubordinate, and rather than executing, they make a brilliant set of strategy choices that are consistent with the choices that have been made above, above them, and then encourage the people below them to make yet another set of brilliant choices that are consistent with those choices so that you have a robust strategy that operates from the top to the bottom of the organization, then what will the diagnosis of the, the reason for that be? Brilliant strategy. Awesome strategy. So the strategy versus execution paradigm makes it an absolute no-win situation for 99.9% .9 of the employees of any corporation. If they're insubordinate and do an awesome job, somebody else gets the credit. If they are subordinate and do what they're told, they get blamed. And you wonder why there's such crummy, quote, implementation. And you wonder why there's such low engagement in the world's modern corporations. Don't wonder. These are anomalies. You shouldn't have people going to work discouraged and feeling like a cog in some big machine. Right? That's an anomaly. If you've got a good theory, a good paradigm, you wouldn't have that. We have it. It's an anomaly. We've got to ask ourselves the question, is trying to get better implementation, better implementation task forces, better implementation this, better implementation that, clear impl implementation, all of that, is that actually going to fix the problem? What I would argue is it's in the very, very latest stages of the eclipse, the Kuhnian eclipse of a paradigm. It's when the anomalies are so great, so pervasive, so persistent, so huge, that we finally might ask the question, is that paradigm an actually useful paradigm? Because what's the paradigm for? It's for usefully organizing our way of thinking. It's a shortcut for, for thinking. Here's how to think about it. Don't start from square one. Just think about it this way. So there's a better, a better paradigm. And the best companies, in, in my view, have people at the bottom who think they're making choices. I shouldn't say it in the Pierre, a fine, a fine hotel, sorry, but Four Seasons, number one hotel, uh, luxury hotel chain in the world by all measures, literally, not most measures, all measures. The bellhop, the busboy, the person at the bar, all think they're making choices. And they got to make a, some brilliant choices with this customer who's standing right in front of my face right now for Four Seasons to be the best hotel chain, a luxury hotel chain in the world by far. It's not an accident. That's the view in, in the company, and that's what makes them better. And interesting enough, since they adopted the strategy, their current strategy, which is now 50 years in the making, nobody's actually tried to replicate it. One of the reasons is the paradigm that the world operates under. OK, second one. Third one, flat jobs. OK, so the world has a paradigm that's been based on a history in 
manufacturing operations and service operations that jobs are flat. What do I mean by flat? It means they're the same every day, every week, every month. So you show up at the call center or you, or you, uh, or you show up at the, at the factory for your shift and you do the same thing from whatever it is, seven to three or eight to four or nine to five, whatever your, or 12 to seven, whatever your shift is. And then you come back the next day and do the same thing over and over again. So we've organized the world by way of flat jobs, the same jobs with the same intensity every day. Now, that has thrown up an anomaly, which is that, interestingly enough, plant productivity, and, these, and this is America, I'm not sure this is the world, but I bet it is, plant productivity has been going up at 3 to 4% a year for time immemorial in America. But there's been this big drop over the last 30 years in overall productivity in America. Productivity growth, not drop in productivity, productivity growth. It's growing at about 1%. How can this be? Well, it's because productivity in white collar jobs is increasing at exactly zero percent a year. And what has happened to the mix between people working in factories and people working in office towers? There's been a dramatic shift over the last 50 years into office towers. Those are what I call decision factories. There's product and service factories and decision factories. And product productivity isn't going up at all there. That's an anomaly. That shouldn't, be, that shouldn't be happening. And what we see is another anomaly. In many corporations, this is what white collar headcount looks like. We binge and hire a whole bunch of people, then we realize we've got too many of them, and we purge them out, then we binge again, and then we purge, and then we binge. I've worked with some companies for a long time, and I've watched these, these go on, binge, purge, binge, purge. You know, it's just, it's, uh, is this what we would expect? And we've had the increase in something called a project management office. It's now replete in organizations where you have the organization, and then it has important stuff to do, and it creates a PMO that puts focus on that important thing to do. Why would that be? That's an anomaly in my, in my view. It's an adaptation. The reason that this is happening is that while product and service factory jobs tend to be flat, they are designed as, as, as flat, decision factory jobs are entirely project-based. All of you guys are in decision factories, is my bet, or at least 95% of you. And if you just think of your life, do you come to work and do the same thing every day, every week, every month, every year? Do you? I would say you don't. Yes, you might have one meeting, the all hands, all staff meeting from 9 to 10 every Monday. But the rest of your time is spent on projects, making a decision. Your decision factory, your output is decisions. For what it's worth, you should think about that. And you have processes. You have work in pro progress, right? That's research. You have finished inventory. You have every, everything that you have in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, product uh, factory. But projects come and projects go. There will be things that each of you can think about that consumed all of an entire week that you never do again in your career. Or you don't do it again for another six months or nine months. It's a whole set of projects that leaf together. It operates differently. The white collar world, the minute Peter Drucker noticed there were these things called knowledge workers, this phenomenon was, was happening where the structure of work changed dramatically. And this is the problem for this, for productivity, for what it's worth, which is, which is 
because it's a whole bunch of projects, they add up to different amounts of time ne necessary over the course of a, a week or a year uh, or, or a career. But what do we staff do? What do you think we staff do? The peak. We're like a public utility. We're like electric utility. You figure out what's the hottest day or the coldest day, depending on where you are of the year, when the power demand is going to be great, and make sure you have generation capacity in place for that, and the rest of the year it sits, it sits idle. This is why, by the way, you see gigantic layoffs, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 white-collar jobs being cut by a big corporation. And you'd think that it would be disastrous, right? They'd be incapable of doing the things they were doing before. And guess what always happens? They figure out how to do everything. So I, be I believe that we have a overcapacity in the decision factories of, of, of America of about 30%. And it's just because we draw the line across the top of, of, of the top thing. Why? It's because when your entire corporation is organized around flat jobs, everybody's tied down to a flat job. And so you can't find capacity for a hump. So you have to make sure the capacity is built in, which creates all sorts of excess capacity. And you can't figure out what's excess and not, because if you've got a flat job, right, and you're in this lull period personally, if this is one person, what do you do? Go lay on a beach all day? What do you do? Make up tasks. That is what you do. You make up stuff to do that may have no actual productivity whatsoever associated with it, but makes you look what? Busy. Busy, busy, busy. And so we can't find the blue part until there's a crisis. When there's a crisis, we lay off 10,000 people. Some of the blue part goes away. Then we rebuild it up. That's why, we, that's why you, you, you purge, and then you binge again until there's another crisis, and, and then you go. It, is, this, is this what the paradigm was intended to produce? Absolutely horrible productivity, binging and purging, ineffectiveness. What I think we need to change to is in the decision factories, which now are typically 60, 70% of the wage bill of the modern corporation. The ones I've looked at, it's, it's, in, it's in that range. That entire decision factory, we should convert the paradigm from you have a job to you have a portfolio of projects. Now, what kind of company in the modern era has that kind of actual fundamental structure? What kind of company? Consulting, professional service firms are, are all organized that way. And you can say, but they're just tiny, tiny little businesses, right? Not, they're not these big businesses. They're not big like Accenture, oops, it's one of those, 40 billion, or Deloitte, 32 billion, or McKinsey, 10 or 15 billion, whichever number you, you want to believe. What kind of company has grown the most prodigiously, other than, other than tech giants who come up with something you know, fantastic? I get that. It's companies that have organized around a portfolio of projects. That is your life in a professional service firm. Whether it's a law firm, an engineering consulting firm, a strategy consulting uh, firm, IT uh, services uh, firm, you're defined by a set of projects. And when those projects are done, you go on to the next project, and you're staffed, uh, staffed accordingly. So that, I think, is the paradigm for the decision factory. We move from job to portfolio of projects. In the, in the, in the service and product factory, I think it's still flat jobs. That is, that is probably the way, the way uh, uh, to do it, uh, but portfolio of projects. I think that means we've got to convert from the notion of we have a dominance of flat jobs in the decision factory, and then this new, new age thing called the PMO, 
to like get done all the important projects while everybody else tries to, <laughs> tries to be as unproductive as humanly possible, stuck in a job that is not structured around, around reality, to a minority of flat jobs. I'm not saying you should wipe out all flat jobs and decision factories. There'll be a few flat jobs. Uh, and then a majority of jobs structured around projects. So you don't have a project management office. Most people think of themselves as running a project. And I'm trying to get companies to do this. It's hard, actually, because it's the paradigm shift problem. Everybody rejects the paradigm. But I, I, I do not think, for example, uh, uh, at Procter & Gamble, who I work with, would be much better off if they had a pool of assistant brand managers and brand managers who could be assigned to projects in one of any of their 50 big brands, not a specific structure for each brand that's a flat job. I think the, the uh, brand managers would be much happier, and you'd be able to get a whole lot more done at a lot lower cost. So you'd have your employees, more productivity, better outputs if you went that way, if you organized around, around projects, not around, uh, around flat jobs. And in your life then, you wouldn't think the paradigm is I have to climb the hierarchy, right? Which is what it is now. To have a good career, I've got to keep on climbing the hierarchy of flat jobs, is instead, you know you're getting better, and you're getting more valuable, and you're going to get paid more, and you're going to have more fun as you get to tackle trickier projects. When a really tricky project comes up, we need, to, we need somebody who's really, really great. And you'll know that you've advanced because you're tackling trickier projects than you used to tackle as you get more experienced and, uh, and better at it. So those are the three paradigms that I think we need to shift in order to make the kind of progress that I think Ricardo and Brightline needs to make, wants to make and needs, needs to make. We have to go from the corporation as a machine to the corporation as a complex adaptive, uh, adaptive uh, system. We've got to go from strategy versus uh, execution to it's all one thing. And the job is to coordinate the cascade of strategy making from the top of the organization to the bottom of the organization. That is the task. And we've got to go from flat jobs to project-based jobs. So those are my thoughts, and I am happy to answer any or all questions until they drag me off the stage. Thank you very much. Thank Ricardo, do you have a question for me? Thank you. <laughs> no, I have a trickier project. Okay. Right line is yes. one of them. Yes. But, uh, yes, you, you do. You do. Yeah. Thank you very much. Is there any, any question, anyone that wants to make a comment or ask a question? Please, uh, we, just, we just need to use the mic for the people on the line. Ah, right, yes. Okay? I wanted you, if you wouldn't mind, to comment on something you brought up about employee disengagement in this system that's not working. And it's, it's increasing, and we all see it, and the search for talent gets harder. Why are we so resistant in recognizing this area of disengagement? Well, I, I think it's because, because we have a, a paradigm that says, um, essentially, they shouldn't be. Right? They shouldn't be disengaged. You know, I'm setting the strategy, and I'm telling them what to do, and it's their job to do what I tell them to do. Right? And because I'm paying them money, that should appeal to their head that, that says, I need this much money, and you're paying me that. You know, why? Wh they shouldn't be engaged. I, I honestly think that's, that's, that's the case. If instead we had a paradigm that says, hmm, it's strat everybody's doing strategy, everybody's making choices, they're all important, uh, and it's projects, and we'd say to that not engaged person, Here's the project I want you to be working on now, uh, and it's super important. Here's how the answer to this fits into what we're doing at the, at, the, at the corporate level. We're depending on you 
coming up with a great answer. I can just tell you the problem. I don't have the time to solve it because I have many problems uh, to, to solve. Please go solve that and go to the allocation manager and get him or her to, to uh, get you a team to work on that, on that uh, project. And I'm waiting with bated breath to hear the answer because it's important to the rest of the, uh, to the, rest of the company. I think your disengagement would be almost zero. A quick follow-up. Do you have one that you, a uh, good example that you would say this is, you, you see a company doing it really well in the new paradigm? I, I honestly think even though they didn't think of it this way when it, when it came to be, although it did to a certain extent, right, for, it's Four Seasons. My, my, it's, it's my favorite example of, of, uh, of this, uh, although at Procter & Gamble, I helped uh, work to convince them when they set up GBS, the biggest, uh, the, the biggest kind of uh, shared services organization in the world at the time, to make it project-oriented and it did fabulously, fabulously uh, well. Um, but Izzy Sharp um, had this, I think, complex adaptive system view of people. He said in the mid-70s, and literally, he lost most of his senior management team over it. He said there was a turnover of it. He said, the only way we are going to have our employees treat our guests the way we'd like them to be treated at a Four season is to treat our employees the way we want them to treat our guests. This in an industry, by the way, that has 60% that has annual turnover. Right? Despite that, we're going to treat our employees like we want them to treat a guest at the Four Seasons. So if you look at the Four Seasons uh, where the employees eat, it would be a nice restaurant to, uh, to eat in where they change their, their, uh, their clothes. They have uh, you know, a certain number of days uh, a year free at a Four Seasons anywhere in the world. And when they go, they get checked into the highest category of room that's available, even if it's the presidential suite at 30,000 a night. And so I think that's a complex adaptive system view. They're these complex, complicated people, and we can't make a set of rules about how you, how you treat them. We'll treat you this way, and then, and then you'll treat them that way. We'll give you all sorts of help. And so you know what the turnover at Four Seasons is? 5%. So the average person you meet in a hotel, you know, kind of in the, in the industry, is, has been there for less than 18 months or is likely to have an 18-month career at that hotel before going somewhere else at Four Seasons. They're on their way to 20 years or have been there tw uh, 20 years. So that would be, that would be the best, best example. Yes, ma'am. Hi, yes. Um, the flat jobs to project-based mm -hmm. um, completely see where that is one of the core problems that we're dealing with right now in my organization. Uh, one of the questions I have is, you know, as this complex adapt adaptive system evolves, mm -hmm. there are, the projects are very different mm -hmm. and it requires different types of skill sets and different people. Um, how does that, how do you see that working uh, with those ups and downs? With that? Sure, I, I mean, it, 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 it honestly feels to me as though an iterative prototyping kind of thing, which is that, which is that you just need people practiced at doing projects, they will be the most adaptive. So when the environment around you is adapting more quickly, there's no, there's no magic bullet to it to say, you know, we'll, we, we'll just have massively adaptive people. I'd say the people who are used to tackling the world as a project, projects are always new and different, would be more likely to do it. If instead, right, you're tied into a job description, right, that says this is your job description, these are the things you do, and now the world has adapted such that those things are all a bad idea, but it's your job description, you'll continue to do what? Your job description. Because if you don't do your job description, what are you? Insubordinate, right? Now, again, you want insubordination in the sense that this is my job description, but the world is changing, I'm gonna do different stuff. But if it's a project instead, then you, then you know this is time bound because you want to make projects time bound and things are going to change and I'm going to do a different project next. So that's how I would say a project-oriented company 
is going to be more adaptable to a, an ongoing environment than one who's tied down to job descriptions defined in flat jobs. I, I think that hand was up first there and then, and then here in the, in the middle after that. I mean, you can, I, I'm. No, no, please. I'm, I'm, I have a lot of questions. Okay, <laughs> okay. They take the you can ask me later. <laughs> Thank yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for walking us through those paradigm yep. shifts. Um, in your experience with the companies that you work with, um, which ones seem to be the most open to, to implementing these shifts? Like, what are the most common characteristics that you're seeing among those companies for being more open to these things? I, I would say it, it literally is a, a designy sort of mind at the top. Right? There, there, are, there are kind of CEOs who are more, I, I, I sort of break CEOs into two categories, <laughs> main categories. CEOs who are set piece. These are CEOs who want their life to be like a Shakespearean play. You know, I know my lines, I know your lines, we're gonna meet and then we're gonna say our lines and we're gonna have everything defined in advance and, and, and there's no surprises, no, uh, no nothing. So those are set piece CEOs. And then there's read and react CEOs who are more inclined to say, you just read the situation and you react, react accordingly. And those are the CEOs who say, hey man, I see a problem, let's come talk about it. And you have no idea, the CEO literally has no idea going into the meeting what the solution will be. So you've got these two kinds. It's the latter kind, the read and react, uh, ones that are more inclined to think about the world in a way that's more consistent with, with how, how I'm thinking about the world. Uh, but I would say there are more set-piece CEOs by far than read and react uh, CEOs. And the set-piece CEOs want to say, no, these are our jobs, these are our processes, these are, this is what we do, I don't want any surprises. Even though last time I checked, I don't know about you guys, but last time I checked, the world seems to be full of surprises constantly, <laughs> uh, but they don't want those. Uh, so I would say that's the number one uh, uh, characteristic that I see as, as, uh, as being more, most determinant of, the, of uh, uh, the question you asked. Yes, right here. Right here, and then we'll go to, we'll go to there next, yeah. Oh, oh okay. Well, well, I had, her, I, had, I had her on the line next, so why don't we do there, we'll do there, and then we'll come to you if that's okay, okay with you. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Um, Stella Lupusor was at a framework. A lot of what you're describing is a joint responsibility of management structures as well as HR processes. Yes. So how do you see this evolving in light of uh, performance management systems and rewards and motivation as well as employment contracts and how that will evolve? Um, you can do project as a regular employee or you can do it as an independent or as a crowd. So how do you see that and where sure. do you think the opportunities for HR professionals are? Sure. Well, I mean, I, I honestly think that the HR field is, is sadly stuck in some paradigms that, that are, are ill-suited for, the, in terms of Darwinian fitness, they are unfit. And, and, that's, and, and there's, there's, a, there's a challenge of, of rethinking uh, uh, a bunch of those. I can talk to you later if you want about uh, about that in more in more uh, detail. That that having been said, people do ask me this question. The, the immediate connotation of being project oriented is the gig economy, etc. I don't believe that, right? Like I, I, I mean, there is the gig economy, and lots of people are going to do things on it as an independent. But what I really am talking about is is you know the the system that I would prefer. <laughs> Is to is is so in my in my beloved Procter and Gamble. The system I prefer is to have each of the ten category presidents, you know, baby care, uh, you know, hair care, etc., uh, laundry, etc. Uh, if, if it was me, I'd add up for each of them uh, what their what their current decision factory HR bill is, all in, including bonuses and everything, and say and so say it's a billion dollars for. For uh, for you know uh, hair care, I'm just making it up. It's not, but I'll, uh, a billion dollars for for uh, for hair care. I'd say to the 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 president of hair care, I'd start out by saying, uh, I I take away the responsibility for you for all those people. They're not going to be Proctor people. 
here's the billing rate for each of them. You have $900 million to spend. You can buy them on a monthly basis. I'd probably say nothing less than a month. Monthly basis, an annual basis, whatever the hell you want, go at it. I believe that no president would spend more than $800 million. They, they literally wouldn't find stuff, projects to do for more, than, for, for more than that. But I'd have all those people employed. I'd have a pool of people just like McKinsey. It would be like McKinsey. I'd have a pool of people who are, who are you know, uh, ABMs, BMs, brand directors, whatever, all of those in, in the various functions, and, and uh, they'd get assigned. And the most important person in the, in the organization after the CEO would be the head of allocation, right? Because they'd have to be thinking about who can do a trickier project than they did last time? What's the professional development for uh, uh, plan and, and time, timeline for, for everybody? Oh, that person has to go work in Asia to get around out their uh, experience. What Asian project can I put them on, et cetera? Um, so that's, that's how, I, how I would do it. But I would not say turn everybody into freelancers. Absolutely, absolutely not. You'd want, as Procter & Gamble, to say, just like, think of McKinsey. Right? Would McKinsey want to say, I want to turn all of my great consultants into freelancers who may then go off and do something else and I don't have access to them? No. I want to develop all these people to be awesome uh, consultants. Or BC, I'm just saying McKinsey is the biggest, but BCG, Bain, would apply to, the, uh, apply to, the, uh, to, uh, to all of them. They'd, they'd want to keep them and, and have those people say, I'm going to get better, more interesting projects with, with in McKinsey than if I did them on my own. Yep. Right here, and then we're going to go over to uh, there. And that might, you've got to tell me how much uh, more I can do. Do we still have time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we still have a couple of things. Go, yep. My name is Ricardo, too, by the way. Oh, really? Okay. Make it well, easy to remember. Good, nice good name. My older brother's name is. So, um, so my question goes back to uh, the way we are structured against those paradigms. And a lot of thoughts come to mind, one of them being, um, should there be a strategy organization called strategy? Because the moment you assign that to a group, the rest of the group, by definition, is not doing strategy, right? So how do you think about titles? How do you think about uh, ensuring that decision-making is truly being cascading down when everybody who has the flat jobs is actually thinking that that's their job in the first place? Yeah. So uh, I guess my question it, is, what mechanisms would you suggest us to consider in order to transition yeah. from one structure to another? It is a very, very good, uh, good question. Uh, I would, I would say, even though I'm a strategy person, I do not believe in there being, you know, kind of consequentially sized strategy de departments. I think it's a line, a line responsibility. However, what I would convert the strategy job to is you need somebody in the organization to be responsible for structuring those cascades, for helping the business to say, okay, you're going to make these choices. Now I'm going to help you with the commissioning of the next set of choices. So for me, leadership in the kind of company I'm talking about means making only the choices that you are most qualified to make. Don't make more than those, just make the ones that you're most qualified to make. Explain those choices to the next level, why you've made them. Commission their choices, say, so now you've got to make a bunch of choices that are consistent with my, my choices commission them, offer to help. Say, I think you can make those choices, but if you struggle making them, that's fine. Come back, and I'll help you make those, those choices. And most importantly, if in making those choices, you cannot find a single decent choice to make, come tell me, because it means what? I've made unimplementable choices, right? So that gets you that, in, in, in my diagram, that gets you the flow upward and downward between the two. I think the structuring of the choice cascade in the co corporation is one of the most complex challenges. And I'd have the strategy department, if you will, or one guy or gal who's really clever, going through the organization, helping each person do exactly that. OK, so who needs to make what choices now based on the choice you've made? I'll help you go commission those. I'll help you go organize so that they get done. But don't do the strategy for them. Like, 
I, I, I'm a little bit old-fashioned and doctrinaire about this. If you're a strategy person needing to do the strategy for a line officer, that is prima facie evidence that the line officer should be fired. <laughs> Full stop. Right? How can they possibly do their job if they have to outsource strategies and the most important choices they make to them? Should be fired. We have time for one. One, more one question. Quick so question. you were okay. The, this gentleman back here was was okay. on the on the line for the next, and I will try to answer it quickly, as opposed to what I'd normally do. <laughs> I was going to say, is this on? Yeah, it's on. I was going to say two quick questions, but yep. we'll collapse them into one. Um, one is when I think about project-based businesses, and I think about financial services and investment banking, which is often a project-based kind of structure along with consulting, and I think they're you know, you see more binge and purge in investment banking than almost any industry. And so I'm sort of curious about that. And also, yep. if, we're, if we go to this uh, project-based uh, modality, which I really like and I think is really strong, and I look at your paradigm shift number two, which is you collapse strategy and execution because it's, it, they're, they're the same, mm -hmm. then suddenly I imagine you have all these project-based teams that are making all of their strategy and execution decisions, and I see you know, a million arrows going in a million different directions, and we lose maybe the sort of fundamental direction of an organization so that sure. you have individually productive teams, but collectively the organization's yeah. not moving forward. Okay, I'll, I'll, answer, the, I'll answer the second one because of shortness of time. We can talk about the other one if you want later. But um, the, uh, it's what happens now. Think about it. Do you think... People actually say, oh, I'm just going to engage in mindless doing because my boss told me so. No, they don't. So it all happens now. And you're right. It's a total mess. Right? It's the product of massive disconnects, massive rework, massive, massive disasters. The, the decision factories suck for a reason. And so all I'm saying is acknowledge it. In, in, in essence, acknowledge it so that you can actually then think about managing it more intensively. And so, you know, it's at such a low level now, right, that I have no fear of, oh, this will make it more confusing. <laughs> it's disastrous already. Disastrous. Like, one of the things to think about is, is the ways, and I'm sure Henry could go, could talk about this at length, the, the ways we've chosen to manage companies have changed very little in the last 50 years. Business school has changed very little in the last 50 years. Corporations in that period have gotten gigantic. General Motors was the largest corporation on the face of the planet by far in 1960. Sales of what, do you think? 10 billion. A behemoth sitting astride the world, gigantic. Of course, it's 50 billion in, in real dollars, but that doesn't, make you un, that doesn't get you in the Dow Jones 30. As companies have gotten gigantic, we have not improved the way we manage them hardly at all. And so we have a total mess. I'd acknowledge it, and then we can make it better would be my, would be my answer. Thank you very much for all the great Thank questions. You, Thank you, Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, I appreciate pressure, it. Thank pressure. You. Thank you.